Greetings and welcome to the Richard Dolan Show, where every week we fight the good fight. I'm glad to be here with you. You know, considering just recently that the United States Congress had its first genuine hearing on the subject of UFOs, now called UAP, it might be interesting to reflect on why that actually even happened. Because during the 1950s, 1960s, there it turns out there were several attempts to establish such a hearing as what we just saw. But all of those attempts basically failed, or when they did happen, and there were a couple of times when they sort of did happen, they were basically disappointments. So why was that? And, you know, are there any lessons from the past that we can learn for our situation today? I think the answer to that is yes, there are. Uh, there are things today that are, we will see, are different, and there are things today that are not different than how things were way back in the 50s and 60s, basically another a whole lifetime ago. I'm going to start out by talking about this man here. This is Donald E. Kehoe. All the UFO geeks out there know exactly who this man was, Donald Kehoe. I think you could say is the original OG of UFO research. He um, actually was a retired Marine Corps major. He was a former friend of Charles Lindbergh, the first man to fly solo across the Atlantic Ocean. Um, as you'll discover, or as you already know, he was a friend of the first director of the CIA, Roscoe Helen Cotter. We're going to talk about Helen Cotter in a moment as well. Kehoe is an interesting guy, and he uh, became a journalist in the 40s and 50s and became interested in UFOs and just took the bull by the horns and wrote many, many early books. And there he is. So in the late 50s, Kehoe uh, became chair of the organization called NICAP. That's the National Investigative Committee on Aerial Phenomena. This was a private organization. They were by far, I think, the most significant UFO group that there was uh, during that period of time. And for Kehoe in particular, his goal, I think, always was the end of UFO secrecy. I think that's a fair way to put it. Um, NICAP had, I think, three admirals on its executive board. It had a, many other leading, uh, like high level military people and other prominent, respectable citizens who were on the board. I think NICAP, right out of the gate in 1957, was a force to be reckoned with. Uh, certainly, its most prominent member was, as I mentioned, uh, Roscoe Helen Cotter, the admiral. He was former director of the CIA. Hill Cotter, turns out, was a firm believer in UFOs. He and Kehoe had also been longtime friends. They had been classmates at Annapolis Naval uh, Officer Academy, believe it or not, way, way, way back in earlier years. So all of that was going on with NICAP. So now during the late 1950s, NICAP made their first attempt to obtain congressional hearings on the matter of UFOs. You think the organization is brand new. Kehoe just comes in. And one of the first things he's trying to do in the summer of 1957 is get congressional hearings on UFOs. Really an amazing thing. Kehoe truly believed that the public had a right to know the truth about UFOs. And he uh, he was also a believer in the American political system, like most people of that time. And he firmly believed that we could work within that system, within, within Congress, uh, to bring about the changes necessary so that the people could get the information they needed. And that was always Kehoe's belief. Uh, I don't think it's uh, nearly as many people believe in the uh, good faith of uh, the government or Congress to do such things today. But in the 50s, it was different. And in the early 60s, especially, it was also quite different. Anyway, backing up. So in July of 1957, Kehoe learned that the U.S. Senate, not the House, the U.S. Senate Subcommittee on Investigations was considering holding hearings on UFOs and had requested NICAP's assistance. So Kehoe contacted several board members for advice, including Roscoe Hillencotter, of course, um, and Hillencotter gave Kehoe advice. He said, look, give the subcommittee a strong sample of evidence but hold some stuff back. So I don't think anything happened with the Senate, but Kehoe was also talking with members of Congress as well about this, who supported the idea of hearings. And one of the members he uh, 
was in touch with uh, the main guy was this one, John McCormick, who was in the House of Representatives for many, many years. In fact, uh, I think he has the record in the state of Massachusetts as the longest member of the House of Representatives ever in his history. And I think he's uh, looked this up. He's 17th of all time in, in Congress. So he was a longstanding member. Even in the late 50s, he'd been there for about 30 years. And McCormick was interesting because uh, a few years after this, he would become Speaker of the House for nine years until he retired. He was also the guy who, who introduced the bill that created NASA, and he was a UFO believer. McCormick was all those things. So Kehoe's talking extensively with him, and McCormick said, you know what? We in the House can we may want to do an investigation into UFOs. And uh, I think I support you in this idea of um, maybe even ending UFO secrecy. He seemed to be on board in his conversations with Keo. Keo was also talking with other members of Congress who showed interest in this issue. Not all the names are mentioned in his books, but I think we can infer that he was talking to a number of individuals. But the thing is that this whole hearing, whether in the Senate or in the House, did not happen. The whole thing just seems to have fizzled out. Um, I think the main reason, at least in this case, well, there are a couple of reasons. One obvious one was timing. This initiative took place very late in the session, made it very difficult before the members had recess uh, to get all the momentum and support. Not that it would have been easy in any case. Um, some of the feedback Kehoe was getting at the time is that they just did not have enough backing to push the hearings through. That's just a very nice way for them to say, yeah, no one, not enough people care or are willing to put their neck out on the line. And additionally, we are pretty certain, Kehoe wrote about this, that the US Air Force was fighting tooth and nail against every single move that NICAP was making, and particularly this movement for uh, UFO hearings in the House or Senate. Uh, they fought against every effort that NICAP did for these hearings. And apparently, and I, I don't know if we know really all of the details even to this day behind the scenes, but they seem to have worked hard to prevent anything from happening. Uh, we are pretty sure they discouraged members of Congress from looking into UFOs and basically from questioning the Air Force. The Air Force kept saying, look, we're handling this responsibly. We're being very scientific about it. Uh, they took every opportunity to discredit NICAP and discredit Kehoe, calling them sensationalists and implying that they were conspiracy theorists. They didn't use that phrase back then, hadn't been used, but essentially that's what they were saying. Uh, and also, at the same time, the Air Force was engaging in significant censorship on the matter of UFOs at this time. This is a copy of uh, head, heading of Gen App 146 that stands for Joint Army Navy Air Force Publication. And this was a very important uh, thing. This took place in 1954, and it really guided reporting procedures within the military and among commercial airline pilots as well, relating to many things, but including UFOs. And essentially what it did is it, uh, if you were an airline pilot, and by the way, up until 1954, there were many, many statements uh, by airline commercial pilots about having seen UFOs. This was discussed quite a lot. It was making newspapers. And after this uh, order went through, that almost stopped completely because uh, airline commercial pilots were now mandated if they saw a UFO on the, in the course of duty, if they were to report it, they were required to report it. And the UFO report then became classified and they were no longer able to discuss it. It was essentially a gag order in the opinion of the commercial airline pilots. Uh, they even started a petition in the aftermath of this, but it didn't go anywhere. Anyway, so that was one way in which the Air Force was holding back uh, discussion on UFOs publicly and kind of stifling. Another thing that was going on behind the scenes that no one knew about uh, in the late 50s was the Robertson panel. And the Robertson panel, again, this is something that's well understood among UFO researchers. Basically, this happened in 1953, and it was a CIA organized, allegedly scientific panel to study UFOs and to provide guidance 
to the military establishment on what to do about it, essentially. And I'm not going to get into all the details of how that whole thing went down. I, I think it's a, very clearly uh, been argued that it was a rigged game from the beginning. There was never going to be any kind of recognition of the reality of UFOs, no matter what evidence they looked at. But what's important about the Robertson panel were their conclusions, which essentially was not scientific, but was public policy. They recommended debunking, that was the word they used, reduce public gullibility uh, on UFOs, demystify UFO reports, reduce public interest in this because they, they were commenting that, wow, this topic evokes a strong psychological reaction among people in these days. So what we'll do is we'll uh, use the mass media. This is all a given for them. They, this is not a problem for the Robertson panel, um, CIA connected scientists here. They said, yeah, we'll use television, we'll use movies, and we'll use uh, newspaper and magazine articles and the like to um, get our message out. Uh, we'll use psychiatrists, we'll use astronomers, celebrities, any of these people that would be important, that would be influential. Basically, influencers in the 1950s, Roberts and Panel people were all over that. Uh, they said, yeah, we got Disney in our back pocket. We'll work with them. Disney will help us. And they also said it would be a good idea to uh, spy on UFO private organizations, essentially because they potentially might be able to have a great influence. They might even be used for subversive purposes. Can't let that happen. We need to keep an eye on them. And they didn't really give explicit uh, advice on what to do with such organizations, but I think the implication is pretty clear. Uh, don't let them do things you don't want them to do. And by the way, that all happened down the road as well. I'll, I'll talk about that another time. So these were things were going on behind the scenes in the late 50s, early 60s that uh, folks like Kehoe didn't really fully know uh, I think he may have gleaned it. He might have got some hints. He knew a little bit about the Robertson panel, uh, even in the early 50s. But I think most of this pressure behind the scenes was not really fully understood by most people in the uh, engaged in the subject. And then let's talk about Roscoe, Helen Carter here. So Helen Carter, as I mentioned, was a, a friend of Kehoe. Uh, he was the first director of the CIA, once it was named the CIA in 1947, that was him. He ran it for three years until the Korean War broke out and then they switched him out, kind of blamed him for uh, not sufficient intelligence on the invasion of South Korea, actually. But in any case, Hill and Carter ran the CIA for three years. And uh, as I said, he was a board member of NICAP. And here he is in 1960, in the midst of all of this, and he's quoted in the New York Times, where he says, it is time for the truth to be brought out behind the scenes. High-ranking Air Force officers are soberly concerned about the UFOs. This flew in the face of everything coming out of the establishment at this time. He goes on, he says, but through official secrecy and ridicule, many citizens are led to believe the unknown flying objects are nonsense. I urge immediate congressional action to reduce the dangers from secrecy about unidentified flying objects. That, that's a wow statement right there. Can you imagine if <laughs> if the congressional hearings to, that we just had had a former director of the CIA coming out and making a statement like that. That would just be an incredible thing. So Helen Carter was essentially calling out the establishment. It really must be seen, in my view, in that exact context. Every other thing coming out of the establishment on UFOs at that time was essentially UFOs are hallucinations or fantasies or hoaxes or misidentification of natural phenomena, nothing to get excited about, go back to sleep, we've got this. That was the exact official uh, statement again and again on UFOs. And here comes the first director of the CIA, exactly the opposite. And he's calling for congressional hearings. So you can see that the whole movement for congressional hearings did not end. Uh, we know, in fact, during the late 50s and early 60s, NICAP continued to approach various government agencies, including Department of Justice, including the National Security Council, the CIA and the U.S. Army, we know this, seeking their cooperation for congressional hearings. Can you imagine going to the CIA back at that time? Uh, 
not surprisingly, they got rebuffed uh, or got denials from every one of those agencies. Now, uh, all of this came to a head in the early months of 1962. So Kehoe, along with other members of NICAP, he's having discussions with different members of Congress. They're showing interest, again, in the UFO interest, in the UFO issue. Uh, one of these is McCormick, who we've discussed already. Uh, Kehoe, in fact, had extensive conversations with McCormick, uh, who believe UFOs are real. Continuing to get resistance from the Air Force and other agencies, Air Force in particular. So by early 1962, Helen Cotter was also communicating with he Kehoe about sitting as a key witness for an upcoming congressional hearing on UFOs. He was on board. At least is what he told Kehoe. This was going to be an extraordinary event. Again, imagine a former director of the CIA presenting to Congress on a hearing about UFOs and saying the kinds of things that Kehoe, uh, that Helen Carter was going to say. That would have been incredible. And then out of the blue in February of 62, no warning. Kehoe was about to meet Helen Carter in person. Helen Carter writes him a note and says, uh, change my mind. Uh, look, we should get off the case of the Air Force. They're, I think they're doing everything that they can do. And by the way, I hereby effectively immediately resign from the board of directors of NICAP. And that was it. That was the end of Hill Cotter. Hill Cotter had been such a strong advocate for open hearings. He had lent his credibility to the UFO issue and to NICAP's cause. So this came as a tremendous shock, without a doubt. It was a really hard blow to NICAP. Why did Helen Cotter resign? Well, he never, he never told Kehoe why. He never explained it. Kehoe inferred, I think it's fair to infer that Helen Cotter was under tremendous pressure. Uh, and the CIA in particular, I think is believed to have exerted influence over Helen Cotter to distance him from NICAP and to prevent him from further supporting NICAP's efforts. This is actually very much in line with other things going on in the UFO field at the same time, late 50s, early 60s. This is Captain Edward Ruppelt uh, of the US Air Force. Ruppelt, of course, was head of Project Blue Book uh, during the key years when Blue Book, especially 1952, when Blue Book was very, very active in investigating UFOs. Uh, Ruppelt wrote, after he left the Air Force, wrote a, uh, a very excellent book on the subject called Report on Unidentified Flying Objects. That was in 1956. But from 54 to 57, Ruppelt was a, a real loose cannon as far as the Air Force was concerned. He'd made a number of public statements in favor of the reality of UFOs, not just his excellent book, which was the most important thing, but he'd made a lot of other statements as well, supporting the reality of UFOs. And then suddenly, um, by early 1958, so after the first failure of, of hearings, uh, really, Ruppelt starts his about face. And it's really quite remarkable. He was going to be on a, a television program with Kehoe and with other individuals, uh, about UFOs. It was called the Armstrong Theater. Uh, Ruppelt and Kehoe had been in contact about it. And Ruppelt um, is there and he backs out at the last minute of that. And then all through 1958, he starts making these disturbing and negative statements about UFOs that he had never made before. And then he starts burning his bridges uh, in terms of relationships with other people in the UFO field. He writes a book in 1960, adds three chapters. Actually, it revises his previous book, adds three chapters, completely debunking everything that he had previously written. It's a, an astonishing thing to read. If you can find a copy of Ruppelt's second edition, it's it's really weird. It's a very weird thing to see. And... Uh, makes fun of Kehoe, makes fun of the whole thing, says this is the modern age fantasy, modern our modern myth, and then died. He died uh, just shortly after that of a heart attack at the age of 37. A lot of times people have wondered, was he murdered secretly? And I mean, I have wondered this myself. It's I don't know to this day. 
uh, the ability to kill someone through inducing a heart attack, even in the early 60s, did exist. There were uh, weapons and chemicals by which to do that. I don't know that that happened to Ruppelt. He had actually had a previous heart attack, even though he was in his 30s. Don't know what his health background really was, but it's very weird. I mean, it's a very strange thing. Uh, clearly, with even aside from the whole issue of, of his death, it is quite obvious that pressure was brought to bear on Edward Ruppelt as well, at the same time that it was being brought against Roscoe Helen Cotter. So, uh, and there's no question at the time that the Air Force was using really heavy handed, uh, we could say ham fisted propaganda tactics against USOs. This is uh, Lawrence Tacker, who for a short while was the leading Air Force spokesman uh, about UFOs. And as you can imagine, was just ripping the subject. He did lots of TV appearances in 1960 and 61 uh, toward the US doing all of these public relations efforts, essentially debunking UFOs. Uh, he, he was so ridiculed by folks in the UFO field. I, I, you get the feeling Tacker was not very successful. And so he was reassigned uh, to Europe in the spring of 1961. And that's, that was his whole thing. But he was, he was another one who was in the mix. So despite all of these setbacks that NICAP was having in the late 50s up and through 1962, NICAP kept on their fight. So through the 1960s, uh, NICAP continued to challenge the Air Force's position on UFOs. NICAP continued to push for open congressional hearings. Uh, and then what happened that surprised everybody was that there was a massive wave of UFO sightings, mostly in the United States, but also in uh, many other parts of the world in the mid-60s. And in 1966, it really hit a crescendo. Uh, and in fact, there were many sightings. It was impossible to keep this out of the news. And it was all over the place, including in the state of Michigan, where uh, this man on the left, that's Gerald Ford, a uh, congressman for the state of Michigan, had constituents who, who had had a very dramatic series of sightings in the town of Dexter, Michigan. And so Ford... Ford wrote an open letter to the man on the right. That's the uh, that was Mendel L. Mendel Rivers, who was the head of the Armed Services Committee in the House. And Ford just said, "Look, I'm really not happy with how the government's handling all of this matter of UFOs. I think we need a formal congressional investigation." And that actually. <laughs> led to a hearing. Now, the thing about Ford, by the way, it's like, what do you really think about Gerald Ford? Gerald Ford at that time, let's not turn him into some hero on behalf of the people. This was a man who was a member of the Warren Commission, which was the commission that covered up the true, uh, the truth about the assassination of John F. Kennedy. That Gerald Ford. I also read, I didn't get this confirmed, but I think it's very likely or possibly true. Tell me if you've heard otherwise that Gerald Ford was a multiple attendee of the annual Bilderberg meetings. Yes, Gerald Ford. Not surprising. Gerald Ford was a total team player for the elite, the establishment during those years. Why else do you think he became vice president, selected the only unelected U.S. president in American history? He selected as vice president by Richard Nixon during Nixon's last uh, year's and then becomes president because Gerald Ford was a team player. That's why. So the whole UFO part of Ford, uh, I don't know if anyone's ever really gotten to the bottom of what was just going on there. But what ended up happening is that there was a single day hearing and uh, these three men presented. Now this, that's uh, Jalen Hynek on the left who was, of course, the astronomical consultant to Project Blue Book. Hynek, of course, famous. Uh, the man in the center was the then Secretary of the Air Force, Harold Brown, later became Secretary of Defense. And then on the right is um, Air Force Major uh, Hector Quintanilla, who was the head of Project Blue Book at the time. That was the Air Force's official UFO investigative group, official. So they all spoke on April 5th, 1966, one day, you could call it a hearing on UFOs. By the way, NICAP, uh, Kehoe, was in the background trying to make this thing happen, but NICAP never got invited to present. Kehoe was a little bit upset about that, considered it a snub 
Uh, I guess you could say it was. I mean, they've been pushing for almost 10 years for this whole thing. Uh, the results of that one day hearing were, you could almost say predictable. So Hynek, uh, who had just had a really unfortunate press conference where the whole issue of swamp gas came out and made him look kind of silly. Um, he stated that, look, UFOs actually deserve more scientific attention. This is a, this is a serious matter. This is, this seems to be real. There's something going on here and we need to be looking into it. Uh, Brown and Quintanilla were a lot more dismissive, especially Quintanilla. But Brown did something interesting. He did direct the Air Force to arrange for a scientific team, he said, to investigate and review the Blue Book sightings that had still been unidentified, which by that, by 1966, had uh, surpassed 600 unidentified sightings. And Brown, uh, the Blue Book people were probably not, were definitely not happy about this. But uh, that was what happened. But essentially, the whole thing fizzled out. Honestly, really nothing significant happened except one <laughs> very important thing. And that's this this man is Edward U. Condon, a very renowned physicist of his time. And Condon was selected to head the United States Air Force's project to lead the independent formal study of UFOs. So really out of Brown's recommendation, you could say we essentially end up with the University of Colorado study known as the Condon Committee, which, I mean, when it first was announced, this was seen as a very hopeful step toward resolving this whole issue. Let, let the scientists get involved, let them do it. Um, unfortunately, it became very clear that Condon's own biases against UFOs very heavily influenced the investigation. So from the beginning, Condon was making very skeptical and dismissive statements about UFOs. He was making all these negative comments to the press, making jokes about it, saying things like, well, we're not supposed to come to any conclusions yet, but, and then making it very clear what he thought about UFOs. He was totally preoccupied with all the crazy elements of UFO culture, it's easy to find even then and now. Uh, those were very easy things. It's low hanging fruit. And Condon absolutely went for all of that. So this, not surprisingly, led many to believe that Condon had already made up his mind about the non-existence of UFOs, which was true, uh, even before the investigations had begun. As the whole thing went on, it became evident Condon himself was not even personally examining of uh, the witnesses and the kinds of evidence that did make the UFO problem so compelling. He wasn't involved in any of that stuff at all. Uh, furthermore, he was not really communicating with the bulk of the investigators who are all University of Colorado academicians, by the way, uh, who were reviewing some of the more credible case material. Conan was just totally out of it. And so this led to claims at the time uh, by Dr. James McDonald, I'll talk about him in a minute, by Donald Kehoe, by other, even members of the Condon Committee, uh, Dr. David Saunders, for example, uh, that the whole thing really was a cover-up. And, you know, when you get to the uh, the Condon report, this is an act, believe it or not, this is an actual photograph that was taken. And, you know, they say a picture can tell, give a thousand words, and this one really does. I mean, look at this flying saucer. This is on top of the Condon Committee report. He puts this little toy on. Th this was a serious, or at least an attempt to be a serious work by genuine academic scientists to study the UFO phenomenon. And here's Condon posing it with a little goofy, dumbass picture, a uh, cop uh, toy of a UFO on this report. How embarrassing. And yet it says a lot, doesn't it? It says a lot. It's like he, his attitude is, this is a joke. We do not need to take this whole thing seriously. And that was exactly what Condon said in his uh, conclusion. He said that the UFOs were a not a problem worthy of further scientific effort, was what he said. And this was the ultimate smackdown against UFOs. The whole thing was obviously influenced by his own biases uh, and 
clearly the political pressure surrounding the investigation, something discussed, in fact, at some length by Dr. David Saunders uh, in his book, uh, you could say expose about the Condon Committee that he wrote in its aftermath. Saunders had been a member of it, talked quite a, little, a, a, quite a lot about that. But essentially, the point of the Condon Committee report wasn't to, to do good science. It was simply effectively to debunk the UFO phenomenon in the eyes of the scientific community and for the public, despite the fact that actually the Condon report had quite a few compelling cases and credible witnesses that suggested otherwise. But uh, it, did, it did the job, messy though it was. Now, uh, while the Condon committee was doing its investigation, in 1968, while all of that was going on, we had another sort of congressional hearing. Let's call it a symposium led by these two men here. Uh, these are uh, both Democrats, one from California, George Miller, and one from Indiana, Edward Roush. Uh, Miller was the chair, but Roush was really the one who ran this. They brought in six, um, you could say, experts to provide testimony. All of these were academicians, all PhDs, as you see here. And this is really quite an interesting, it was a single day symposium on July 29th, 1968. It was sponsored by the House Science and Astronautics Committee. I would say this was a significant event uh, and a departure from the previous hearing from 1966, in the sense that you had uh, quite a few major UFO researchers at the time invited to testify. So you've got James McDonald, Alan Hynek. Uh, you can see the other names on the on the right there. You see uh, Carl Sagan of Cornell University, probably the most famous of them all, and others. Um, I would say McDonald stole the show. He made a very significant impression. He provided 30 pages of verified UFO reports to the members of Congress. He recommended uh, what he, a rapid escalation of what he called a serious scientific attention to this extraordinary, intriguing puzzle. Uh, I think his paper was called Science in Default, if I'm not mistaken. And he it was a major criticism of con the contemporary scientific community for failing to do its duty and investigate this incredible scientific phenomenon. Uh, Robert Baker, who's in there, third from the left. Uh, Baker was a UCLA engineering professor. Uh, he said something quite interesting too. He recommended that Congress create an interdisciplinary mobile task force. This is his words, or a team of highly qualified scientists on a long-term basis, well-funded and equipped to swing into action and investigate reports on anomalistic phenomena, end quote. Can you imagine? Essentially, Baker was calling for a U.S. government-sponsored UFO action and investigation team organized on strictly scientific protocols. So um, quite fascinating. Of those six scientists who testified, five of them believed that UFOs presented a genuine scientific anomaly that demanded further study. Five out of those six. Only Carl Sagan disagreed with that point of view. It's interesting. Sagan is always lionized as this open-minded thinker, life out in the universe and all that. But Sagan was a hardcore UFO debunker and skeptic. Anyway, that was the symposium. It was one day. Uh, it did not really result in much. I mean, think about it. This is uh, the conduct committee was still doing its thing. Uh, you could say it highlighted a divide within the scientific community regarding UFOs. Uh, and any victory that it might have provided was negated almost immediately when the Condon Committee in the very beginning of 1969 uh, gave the UFOs the ultimate, the ultimate smackdown in its negative conclusions. So a couple of other factors to just uh, keep in mind as to why uh, the hearings really just didn't happen. Uh, so you can say the overall political climate and and the fear of upsetting national security. Look, we're in the Cold War here. The 1950s and 60s was dominated by the Cold War, America versus the Soviet Union. It's not all that different today, frankly. We we have a similar kind of a a, a kind of a new Cold War that we're all living in. 
But the Cold War of the 1950s and 60s really was quite severe and uh, very entrenched. And so and UFOs were primarily and essentially viewed through that lens, I would say, of national security. Uh, and I, I would say those individuals with the highest levels of need to know about UFOs fully understood that the phenomenon was something anomalous and extraordinary, and they had their own reasons for not letting this go forward. But even if you were a member of Congress and you were not read into all of that, you were probably uh, of the feeling that, look, this is a national security thing. Whatever these sightings are, whether they misinterpreted Soviet activity or misinterpreted our own black budget stuff, our own secret technology. This was not something that a lot of members of Congress were excited about bringing up. There, I think there was a very strong reluctance about a lot of the political establishment for dealing, uh, for getting involved in this. So, I mean, it was sensitive information, I think you could say, and, and they, didn't want to. And plus, you know, the U.S. government had its public relations program. They had Project Blue Book. Uh, and I think it's very clear that there was a lot of pressure behind the scenes uh, to resist that. And that gets us into the institutional resistance from the Air Force, from the CIA, uh, who basically had their own reputations were on the line. First of all, the Air Force with Project Blue Book was absolutely not interested in having this phenomenon discussed military encounters. None of those had been declassified by the, uh, at the time, by the mid and late seventies, some of them were becoming declassified, but in the sixties, they had not been declassified. And, uh, you know, it's for us absolute certainty that the Air Force did not <clears throat> want any of these encounters to become discussed or known. And who knows where a congressional hearing might go. And so the, and, and the CIA had the exact same attitude about this. NICAP's strategy was an interesting one. Uh, and what I mean by that is, and this is really quite familiar to people following the UFO UAP hearings today, because the UFO in, uh, issue was so fringe back then and so taboo, Kehoe particularly framed the need to investigate UFOs as a potential threat to national security. Sound familiar? Yeah. Kehoe argued that these unidentified objects could be, they could be misinterpreted as Soviet missiles, which was a concern that actually was shared with parts of the defense community. We know this because it was discussed. Uh, that was the primary way that he brought this whole potential threat scenario. Um, everything Kehoe did, everything NICAP did, was designed to appeal to all of the nationalistic, patriotic, anti-communist sentiment in Congress at the time, and, and this focus on national security. Now, you could wonder if that strategy had its own weaknesses, its own limitations, because I've wondered. Um by tying the UFO issue so closely to national security, did Kehoe, this is just a question. I don't, I think the answer is actually no, but I'm asking it anyway. Did Kehoe inadvertently reinforce the perception that this subject was just too hot to handle, that it was a matter of defense primarily rather than a scientific matter or some exploratory kind of matter? which here, James McDonald, when he did his statement at the symposium, he's saying, look, this is a scientific matter that demands scientific exploration. Kehoe didn't really do that. Now, I don't know that it would have made any bit of difference, frankly, if NICAP had said, this is a scientific matter, we need to deal with this, rather than hit the national security threat approach. Um, but you could at least wonder, did that contribute to the reluctance of some members of Congress to hold open hearings because they didn't want to step on the toes of the CIA um, or the Air Force. You know, it wouldn't have been a good look for them at that time. So uh, I think ultimately uh, what I would say is the national security angle was probably the only one that ever had a chance of working. Uh, and again, let me, let me just take this slide off here. Uh, and the reason being you've got so much institutional resistance uh, 
uh, in the 1950s and 60s to this whole subject, you really have to ask yourself, how else would NICAP get the attention of, of members of Congress who've got a million other things impinging on them, all these other attitudes, uh, all these other uh, issues, and knowing that the UFO subject was essentially a third rail that would electrocute your political career if you were to go there. I mean, this was not an easy subject to get a member of Congress to talk about. So it's pretty easy to see why Kehoe, and now much later, people today trying to shake the uh, shoulders of members of Congress saying, look, this is a potential threat. This is a national security thing. You need to look at this because this is important. Not a difficult strategy to understand. So I, I don't think anything else would have worked any better, but it is a question simply to ask. And then um, I mentioned the Robertson panel earlier, so I'm not really gonna need to get into that too much. I think the Robertson panel had a significant uh, uh, part to play here. Uh, in fact, I'm gonna talk about one other thing that the Robertson panel did in just a moment. Before I do that though, um, one other thing I could have put this into the slide was the whole idea of physical evidence. Um, it's not that in the current, the recent hearings that physical evidence was, was brought out. It wasn't, but at least what happened in 2023 in those congressional hearings is that physical evidence was discussed, uh, particularly by David Grush, who at least talked about physical artifacts, in fact, downed craft, quite a few, he said. Um, being possessed by U.S. defense, uh, the U.S. defense establishment or private contractors. So there was discussion of actual physical artifacts. And then even also more recently, we've heard about the so-called metamaterial, which remains quite interesting. We haven't heard anything about that lately, but it's an interesting artifact. So all of that is interesting and we can discuss that today. It would have been very difficult for NICAP or other private UFO advocates back in the 50s and 60s to make similar claims, or even to have hinted about physical artifacts. Um, I think that there were people back then who had heard of physical artifacts. One board member of NICAP back in those days was Wilbert B. Smith, who was a Canadian government official. Uh, Smith uh, famously, at the end of his life in 1962, had a conversation with some researchers where he said explicitly that he had handled such an artifact that was. I mean, this is an incredible thing, but he said it was given to him briefly by the Air Force and he gave it back to a very ultra, ultra high level group. And the interviewers are like, well, who'd you give it back to? And Smith said, well, <laughs> was it the CIA? They asked, he says, look, they, they were as high as you get. That's all I'm gonna say. If you wanna figure it out, good luck. Uh, and then he, he died not long after that. So Smith knew Kehoe. Uh, one can assume Kehoe knew or had heard about alleged artifacts whether he believed it or not is another question. I suspect he did, but it, that's a long way from being able to talk about it publicly and, and being able to defend that in public. So the folks in NICAP uh, did not mention artifacts ever back in those days. In fact, nobody did. The whole concept of crash retrievals didn't really start making headway until the very late 70s. So, um, so that's that. Now back to the Robertson panel and their... Um, one last influence that they had on this whole matter in the 1960s was this TV special from 1966. This was on CBS. That's Walter Cronkite uh, pictured there, but the by far the most famous and respected newsman in the country back in those days. And he hosted a special in 1966 when all of this discussion was out there uh, UFO, UFOs, friend, foe, or fantasy? And of course, the answer is in that very final word. That's what they conclude. In fact, they brought Carl Sagan in. He uses phrases like pseudoscience to discuss UFOs. And here's Cronkite. He says at the end, no evidence that anything out there has come here. One thing is clear. You could not keep a spaceship a secret. That's a direct quote from Walter Cronkite. And then he just said, and by the way, you know, if anything important were to happen, it's probably best to just let scientists and the military take care of it. You people don't really need to uh, do anything about this. Uh, one other thing that they had here, or that I want to point out, is that we know this was a Robertson panel 
uh, a recommended recommended action because this is a letter from one of the members of the Robertson panel, Thornton Page, in 1966, confirming the role of the CIA in this CBS program. So he puts it right in there, uh, plain as day. And I think we're now getting to one of the key factors in why all of these attempts by NICAP and the UFO activists of the day, why they <clears throat> either failed outright or were greatly disappointed when any any small hearing did happen. And I think it's the culture of ridicule that was so intense. Now, the CIA, uh, the CBS special that I just referred to, didn't so much ridicule UFOs. Well, I did a little bit. When you get, uh, you know, a member of the establishment like Carl Sagan talking about this as pseudoscience, that's almost getting into ridicule. It's it's a definite uh, condescending attitude that was designed explicitly to tell any other scientist or academician, uh, don't don't even think about studying this. This is pseudoscience. You're just going to ruin your career. And I think we can include that as part of the culture of ridicule, which was so deeply entrenched in that time of the 1960s and the 50s, and then even later in the 70s and 80s. And it really never stopped until just a couple of years ago. In fact, let me just talk a little bit, very briefly, about how this completely continued right in well into the 21st century. There's... Um, Quite a lot of of newspaper coverage on. In fact, you know, my uh, my friend Stephen Bassett over at Paradigm Research Group has uh, perhaps the largest uh, collection of newspaper uh, links uh, on UFOs that I know of anywhere. Uh, he's got these and met much more, much more. But you know, here you've got these are from about a decade ago or, or even less. Uh, Mother Jones or. Um, the Daily Beast, which, you know, back especially then posed as like hip kind of cutting edge uh, alternative publications, which they're anything of the sort. They're utterly mainstream, but, uh, you know, ripping on UFOs. Uh, but the real one you want to get to is the Washington Post, which just, I think, made it its mission for decades to be the most embarrassingly cringeworthy UFO debunking publication in the United States, I think, bar none. The WAPO, just every opportunity that they ever had to knock this subject down, they just took it. And in just the most obvious, uh, extreme ways, uh, 10 years ago, 2013, it's not that long ago, the uh, Steve Bassett organized the citizen hearing on disclosure. I was a part of that. I was very proud to be a member of the citizen hearing. I was quite active there. Uh, there were 40 of us. Uh, researchers, witnesses, and like providing testimony for a full week to six retired members of Congress. It was, in fact, a mock hearing. Uh, that is, excuse me, the correct phrase to describe it, but it was a very serious thing as well. And I spoke with every one of those members of, uh, of Congress and, and the Senate who were there. And I can tell you for a fact that those individuals were shocked at how good the evidence was. I, I think, I don't know if all of them became UFO believers, but definitely most of them did. And all of them became very respectful to the subject. Uh, that I know for an absolute fact, but here's the Washington Post covering it. And uh, they use phrases like, this is like a bizarro parallel universe. They describe the hearings as just, you know, and um and they, the Washington Post at the same time came out with a bunch of other really just ridiculous articles. The Conspiracy Religion, UFOs and You. Clap if you believe in fairies. Squint upward if you believe in UFOs. This is in 2013. Uh, the Fear That Drives Our Alien Belief. And, uh, you know, it's worth mentioning that the Washington Post was purchased that year by Jeff Bezos, who with Amazon had done a massive amount of cloud computing for the CIA and a whole bunch of other three-letter agencies, and he buys the Washington Post. Uh, the Washington Post is, without question, the uh, 
institute the the publication for the intelligence community. They have been that for years, but were just right up through 2013 and beyond, in fact, continually slamming the subject of UFOs with the notion of actual ridicule. So that culture of ridicule was entrenched right up until 2017, right up until then. And this was really the thing that changed where you get the New York Times and Politico coming out with their articles that talk about the Tic Tac UFO and the ATIP program and David Fravor and all of that. And you start to see a transformation of our public discourse starting then. That really is the most significant difference that we have today as opposed to back then. Uh, there's a couple of other differences. I'll get to that. But essentially, when, when this hearing happened this year, I actually considered it pretty much a small miracle that anything like this happened. But I think the removal of so much of the stigma attached to the subject of UFO probably was 90% of the reason why it was able to happen. Uh, I haven't really bothered to get into, in this analysis, all the reasons why the hearing actually did happen. I think we will want to come back to that. Instead here, I wanted to highlight uh, the key factors that cause prior attempts at a hearing to end in failure. Again, I think we'll return to the 2023 UAP hearing in the future. But for now, I think it's very useful just to appreciate the difficulties that prior generations of researchers and activists did face in their attempts to move this issue forward. I would say that ultimately Kehoe and NICAP faced an utterly implacable national security establishment. I don't think that establishment has changed all that much in its attitude over the years since then. But the other thing that has changed, other than the the elimination of so much of the ridicule. And this is something that I've been uh, thinking about for a very long time and waiting for it to happen. And I think now it has happened, which is that uh, enough of a societal and technological transformation has occurred over the past several decades. We're really talking about the web here, that a push from below was successfully able to happen. And this, this really is all about the internet. I mean, since the 1990s, our world has been revolutionized. If, if you were around prior to the 1990s, you know what I'm talking about. The radical ability for us to exchange information, which we all take for granted today, was not the case prior really to the mid 1980s, 1990s. So it has radically affected our culture uh, in the process. And that includes the UFO subject. And for me, for the last at least 15, 20 years, I have been waiting for the internet era eventually to result in some kind of disruption to the system of control of UFO information. And I do think that we are seeing some of the result of that. I do think that the push since 2017 is in some measure, a significant measure, uh, a reflection of the broader social and technological changes that we have been seeing. And primarily these are related to the internet. Now, of course, the other side of the fence still keeps many of their most effective weapons. Uh, indeed, I would say that side may well succeed in its efforts, as I see it, in reestablishing near total control over public discourse on UFOs, or which we, they now call UAP. Uh, they've got a lot of tools in their toolkit. Again, I'm going to come back to that uh, in, in further programs. But for now, I guess we'll just say, let's not dismiss the gains that have been made over the past few years regarding UFO or UAP information and the verified data that we have gotten. We should not be surprised that at some point these gains may develop a power and momentum of their own. It's not impossible. One other thing I guess I'll just say in terms of uh, the current push or the recent push that we have seen, which may happen, there may be more congressional hearings. There's certainly discussion about this. But one might suspect that another motivation for the recent hearing, behind the scenes, I'm saying, uh, a motivation which certainly would not have applied 60 plus years ago, is financial. And here I speak of corporate incentives. 
to cash in on the UAP technology bonanza, assuming that that is the case. I think that is the case. Um, and also assuming that some corporations and some circles are aware of the reality of this technology, which is perhaps off limits to them and perhaps they want access to it. Uh, we've been hearing, at least researchers like myself, I've been hearing rumors of this for years. And I suspect that this is the case. Back in the 1960s, I don't think the situation was anywhere nearly as advanced in that regard as it is today. So I think financial matters behind the scenes are very likely to be considered important in this matter. So essentially, I think the warriors of several generations ago had very little going for them and everything stacked against them in what they were trying to accomplish, particularly people like Donald Kehoe. They most definitely fought the good fight. This was a true David and Goliath story, except in this case, well, they didn't kill the giant. We may hope, however, that future efforts can do just that. Yeah, we will see. This is not a done deal one way or the other. And uh, if we can call the fight to end UFO secrecy, if we want to call it that, uh, it's not clear that it will definitely go in one direction or the other. I don't think either result is inevitable. So again, I think I'll just reiterate that this presentation that I've given here wasn't about the recent hearing. Uh, as I've said, it's really to highlight the attempts and failures of the past. But I do think that there are lessons in there for our time today. And again, I will be returning to them in future installments of this program. And that's all I have for you. Thank you for being here again with me. If you like this video, please like and share it. You can subscribe to my channel and turn on notifications. Also, if you like what I do, consider joining my website, richardolanmembers.com, where I create content like this all the time. And again, that's all I've got for you. Please have a wonderful day or evening wherever you are. And remember, let's keep fighting the good fight. Later.